Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. And when Bill Moyers interviewed me on our 50th anniversary program a while back, a viewer waggishly wrote that perhaps L for longevity should become my middle initial. And now that's truer, much truer now than ever before, of course, as it turns 54 years since I began to produce and host this series as indeed my wife and I mark our 60th anniversary this year, and particularly as I'll tell my new students at Rutgers this fall that I first came to teach history and political science on the banks of the old Raritan on July 1, 1948, one heck of a long time ago. In other words, I'm an old man, and I'll just assume as one of the prerogatives of age that today I may use Rutgers as the fulcrum for a further discussion of the role of massive public universities in 21st century America. Appropriately enough as well, my guest again today is Richard L. McCormick, who led still another of the nation's great public institutions, the University of Washington, from 1995 to 2002, then became president of Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. But before we talk about public higher education and the ever more critical role it will play in our lives, I want to share with you a very brief Rutgers-produced visual presentation of how, like many others, this particular state institution of higher learning has grown to serve its citizens and the nation. Rutgers has a long and rich history as the eighth oldest university in the country. It became the State University of New Jersey in 1956, fully embracing its mission of teaching, research, and public service. In 1989, Rutgers was invited to join the prestigious Association of American Universities, a group of the top 62 research universities in North America. The university is rooted in New Jersey, one of the most diverse, densely populated, and complex states in the nation, making it an ideal place to discover and test solutions for the 21st century. Rutgers is an educational powerhouse. With nearly 10,000 part-time and full-time faculty and staff, Rutgers offers over 180 bachelor's, master's, doctoral, and professional programs. You can also look at the wonderful national fellowships that our undergraduates win. Gates, Rhodes, Fulbrights, Marshalls, Churchills, Trumans, Goldwaters, all of these are measures of the attention that Rutgers gives to undergraduates and the support it brings to undergraduates. Rutgers has 360,000 living alumni and adds 10,000 new graduates each year. Alumni have achieved widespread acclaim in their professional and civic lives, from Paul Robeson and Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman, to sculptor Alice Aycock, chef and entrepreneur Mario Batali, and Pulitzer Prize winning author Juno Diaz. Well, Rutgers uh, ranks higher and higher nationally. Uh, the AAU of some years ago was, was a sign of a, a, a university as, as a research university, how it arrived. 
but more importantly, our departments, philosophy is now number one in the country, many other departments. We have, you know, when students come here, they can do everything from uh, uh, anthropology to zoology, uh, from library science to computer science. Uh, there's almost nothing a motivated student could not manage to do at Rutgers and do it very well. With three campuses and facilities across the state, Rutgers makes an impact in every county in New Jersey. It's a vital resource for New Jersey businesses, training sophisticated and highly skilled workers, and providing data, reports, and other services. Last year, Rutgers brought in 391 million of research funds, and the state gets back six times its investment of what it puts into Rutgers. Um, we've generated 28 million in royalty income, uh, we've started 25 companies in the past five years, and we've generated 150 patents in the past five years as well. Rutgers has an international reputation with teaching centers around the globe. Now approaching its 250th anniversary, Rutgers continues its work as a premier public research university committed to educating promising students and to resolving the complex challenges of tomorrow faced by New Jersey and the world. President McCormick, uh, after that visual presentation of what you and Rutgers are doing, I, I have to comment that when you were here before, you were, I thought, a very optimistic person. Now, a few years have gone by, <clears throat> lots have happened, has happened to our economy. Do you carry with you that same uh, optimism? Well, I do, uh, but like any university president these days, I'm certainly mindful of the impact of the economy on our students and on our institutions. Uh, and the impacts are, the impacts are important. Uh, students are, are having more difficulty paying for college. Uh, they and their families may have experienced uh, the impact of the downturn. And for our part, the institution has, uh, has hurt as well. Uh, as, for example, New Jersey state revenues have declined. Uh, once again, our institutional budgets are being, are being cut. And the, and the, impacts, uh, the impacts are severe. If, uh, if the uh, recommendations set forth by our governor are enacted, uh, Rutgers' uh, base uh, appropriation from the state of New Jersey will be back to where it was in, in 1994. Fortunately, fortunately uh, our, our faculty and our staff and our students have undertaken a, a great many things to respond to that, and hence the basis for my continued optimism. Our faculty brought in more in research support last year than ever before, almost $400 million. Uh, our foundation raised more than ever before, almost $130 million. And our uh, uh, all kinds of uh, revenue generating programs, executive education, continuing education, online education, are uh, endeavoring uh, to, to compensate for what we're losing in state appropriated support. So my belief in uh, the power of, uh, of public higher education is undaunted as is my conviction that Rutgers and other institutions like it will meet the challenges of the 21st century as well as they have the 19th and the 21st century as well as they have the 19th and the 20th. Well, I know that uh, uh, when this program, when our discussion today is first seen in the New York metropolitan area, <clears throat> that same day Rutgers will be celebrating Rutgers Day and what, you had 50,000 or more people there last year? April 24th, 2010 is Rutgers Day. And, and last year, I think it was April 25th, uh, the first ever Rutgers Day in 2009, we had about 50,000 people on our campus. Uh, and, and they saw uh, no less than 400 um, examples, exhibits, presentations, speeches, opportunities for participation, uh, performances, um, illustrating uh, the wide, wide, wide range of what a great public research university does. It's so important to be able to share with the people of our state, and, and some came from beyond the borders of New Jersey, so important to be able to share the extraordinary range of educational opportunities we provide, research we do, and service that we give to the nation and the, and the world based on, uh, based on the work of our faculty and students. Well, I know I'm prejudiced. I have my bias, uh, naturally. <clears throat> what I've maintained, after all these years of teaching at Rutgers, that in all probability, a smart student who is well-guided, who knows her or his way around,
can probably get as good, at least as good an education on the banks of the old Raritan as any place in uh, this country. Uh, uh, Mr. Hefner, I, I absolutely agree with you. I'm a little biased too. I grew up at Rutgers. I taught on the faculty for 16 years before going away for a while and now I'm returned as president and you're absolutely correct. Our 54,000 students, biggest enrollment we've ever had, have uh, amazing educational opportunities. Now, now compared to what they would experience perhaps at a at a, at a wealthier private institution, maybe a small liberal arts college, uh, they may have to work a little harder to find those opportunities and to take full advantage of them. But for those who do that, and happily the great majority of our Rutgers students do, they get a terrific education at an affordable, at an affordable price. Affordable price. Now, can that be debated? Sure what does it, it mean, affordable price? Sure it can. Well, our tuition is currently about $11,000. Uh, if, um, if a student lives on campus and eats in the dining hall, in other words, the full, the full nine yards of the college experience, uh, it would be about $21,000. Uh, it has risen in recent years to be sure, but for that matter, so have the costs of all, of all institutions. About 80% of our students uh, qualify for financial aid, generally need-based financial aid. So the majority of them don't pay, uh, shall I say, the full sticker price. Um, they, have, uh, they have help from the federal government through Pell Grants and from the state of New Jersey through tuition aid grants and, and from Rutgers, which uh, sets aside millions of dollars each year for, for financial aid for students who need it. So, um, sure, the price has gone up, though it's still a lot lower than uh, uh, many other institutions. And uh, those, who, those who need help, those who need help paying the bill will have it. You know, uh, a little more than a year ago, Vartan Gregorian, the president of the Carnegie Corporation of New York, <coughs> joined me here talking about the full two-page, uh, I called it an ad, Vartan was upset by that, he called it an open letter to President-elect Obama and his administration, uh, urging the enactment of a Higher Education Investment Act. When in the middle of the night, you face the realities. Uh, do you think we understand as a people well enough this matter of investment, of investing in higher education? No, you know, I, I really don't. Um, my, my parents' generation of Americans uh, living their adult lives in the decades after World War II understood it. They made vast and uh, historic uh, investments in, uh, in higher education, inventing community colleges, dramatically expanding traditional institutions like Rutgers, investing hundreds of millions and ultimately billions in student financial aid and in scientific research. Those, those investments changed the nation and the world. They opened up higher education opportunities to men and women who never would have had it in earlier years, and they, and they uh, catapulted the United States into scientific and technological and, yes, economic preeminence. Those were investments that paid off hugely, and, and I'm afraid that uh, the appetite of the American people for such investments has declined. It's not entirely gone away. Certainly the federal government continues to support scientific and technological research, though perhaps not at the levels that it should. Uh, certainly federal financial aid is still there, though too much of that money is in the form of loans. But the states in particular have dialed back their investment in, in public higher education, believing, um, understandably, but I think wrongly, um, that the cost ought to be borne increasingly, perhaps eventually entirely, by those who are in the classroom and get the degree, not, not recognizing, as my parents' generation did, that our whole society benefits, our problems are uh, more readily solved, our economy grows, and our opportunities are vastly enlarged when, 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 when everyone uh, has an opportunity to go to college, and that it's worth, it's worth a collective investment, not just the payment of tuition by the student who earns the degree. You're an American historian. Pray tell, what is your own interpretation of that shift between your parents' generation, my generation? In fact, your dad and I taught together uh, right. at Rutgers. What's, what's happened? My dad, in fact, joined the faculty just about the same time that uh, that you did in the late in the late right. 1940s. Well, you know, uh, I'm, I'm I'm not sure. Certainly, there are there are vast competing demands upon scarce gov governmental resources. Healthcare, for example, uh, is a lot more expensive than it was uh, in those in in those years, and the uh, expectations for 
uh, government investment in a myriad of things have grown. And so higher education has more competition for scarce dollars. I think there's also a, a growing sentiment that those who, those who benefit should pay. It's well known, for example, that a person with a college degree will earn very considerably more over her or his lifetime than someone without one. So the, so the theory goes, well, let them, let, them, let them pay. You mean uh, take on debt? Let them take on debt, which is, which is in fact what, what many of our students have to do, or let them, let them pay more, let their family dip uh, more deeply into, into resources they may have accumulated, whatever uh, the individual or the individual family, it is now thought, should, should bear the burden. Uh, so many, so many other nations in the world are looking at it. Otherwise, in Asia, for example, um, huge, huge investments are being made by uh, economies and, and nations that are looking to the future and counting on colleges and universities to propel them toward that future and into it and, and through it. And we, uh, it's like we've been there and done that and aren't doing it so much anymore. Uh, I, I think the responsibility lies with us in the colleges and universities, however, to make the case. I, I am not suggesting that it's all somebody else's fault or uh, the burden rests entirely with, uh, let us say, short-sighted public officials. That's not the case. Uh, we in the colleges and universities have to do as well as they did uh, during the uh, era after World War II to explain why the investments that you're, that you're mentioning should be made. But Dr. McCormick, uh you say you're not blaming others, and I, I uh, appreciate that. I'm not so aware that it was the academic community that played that role. Uh, your mother and father right. Uh, my generation, yes. I don't think it was so much the academic community interpreting the need uh, for our public offices. Well, there was a, something else. That's a very shrewd point. That's a very, very good point. Uh, men and women in, in public life uh, and, and in business uh, and, and civically aware people joined together, as it were, almost with one voice in that era to make the case for those investments. Um, the college presidents of the day no doubt joined in, um, but they, uh, they did not bear the, they by no means bore the full burden of explaining why the American people should invest in, in, in higher education. Uh, those, those other voices beyond the boundaries of our campuses now, seemed, now seem uh, muted. Uh, they, have, uh, they have their eyes on other concerns, perhaps their own concerns, um, and, and, and the, tide, the tide has turned. I, 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 must, I must say, though, I, I, feel that, I feel the spirit um, still uh, encourages my, my, my optimism. There, uh, there, there are few parents out there who do not want their children to go to college. Uh, there are few towns and municipalities and cities out there that don't want their institutions to be larger and to contribute more greatly to the economy. Um, the American people, polls show every, every day, have a very, very high regard for uh, this nation's institutions of higher education. And uh, we are, and I mentioned this toward the beginning of my remarks today, we are finding other means to achieve our goals. So I, um, I, I wish, um, I, I wish uh, that the spirit of investment that was in the uh, uh, open letter that Vartan authored and I had the privilege of signing uh, to then President-elect Obama, I wish that spirit of investment was, was even more alive than it is today. But colleges and universities are resilient, are just as essential to the future of our people and the nation and the world as they were 50 years ago. And uh, the, the determination of Americans to see their children to college and of, of, uh, of communities to uh, have those institutions thrive is, is the best evidence of it. Do you think uh, Vartan and, and the letter that uh, you people sent to the Times, make, it makes the point that in crisis times, even in crisis times, when we were worried about uh, national survival, there was a GI Bill uh, that Lincoln was able to think in a forward manner. With the Morrill Act. With the Morrill Act. That in so many instances, we've known in crisis time that there was going to be a tomorrow and we had to prepare for it and invest for it. Do you think that that's what's gone? Not gone but diminished in our uh, American well, psyche? Well, it is, it, it is, it is diminished. Uh, certainly there are 
uh, too few summonses uh, by our leaders uh, within the institutions and within the government and in business to, uh, to, to a new day and a, and a tomorrow, uh, of which we can be even prouder. Um, the, uh, the, the optimism I'm, I'm expressing today is ad admittedly sometimes uh, more difficult to maintain. I, I, do believe, I do believe we're coming through the current recession and that uh, the, 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 the strongest institutions, one of which is my own, uh, will, will, will not only survive but, but thrive. But it is a it is a it is a warier uh, environment. It is a perhaps a more cynical environment, um, and it's uh, uh, it it it, uh, it it demands uh, greater effort and greater resilience on the part of colleges. That's very interesting. You say a warier environment, a more cynical environment. You think that's a clue to what we're talking about here, the basic problem? Well, it it uh, it, it 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 may be. Um, certainly I remember, I referred to my parents' generation, so I'll refer uh, for a moment to my actual parents who, who had their careers uh, uh, within uh, Rutgers. Uh, they, uh, they, they took such enormous pride in the growth of its enrollments and the construction of each building. I remember as a child going out and looking at the cranes that were being used to build the new dormitories along the Raritan River. Uh, th there was an enormous uh, sense of op optimism, and, and wariness would not have been a, a byword. Um, uh, I, I, I do think uh, I do think people have pulled in the have pulled in the reins. I think there is uh, there there is a sense of uh, the, the need to take care of oneself and, and one's own, and maybe uh, maybe a diminished sense of uh, of generosity. But the greatest the greatest institutions will will rise above that, and uh, and will continue to produce leaders who who summon us to be more than we currently are, and who will sweep wariness aside with their with their look with their look to the future. Well, I know why you're the president and why I'm just a teacher, because you can maintain that optimism, and I find myself maybe because of my years a wash in the sense that this concept of investment that Vartan and you and your colleagues, uh, the chief executives of state universities, understood that that's not shared uh, anymore. Uh, and uh, I'm not trying to drive you down to my level of... Um, well, let me, let me, um, let me respond. It, it is, certainly it is not shared uh, uh, in, in the same way that it was in the 1950s and 60s and, and 70s. But besides my, uh, besides my service as president, I also teach at Rutgers, just as you do. And I, uh, I taught this year a, a first-year seminar for 20 19-year-olds, all from, all from New Jersey, 20 19-year-olds from suburban New Jersey, uh, uh, both genders, all colors, a uh, very wide a variety of economic circumstances. But, but sharing uh, it, it enormous, well, affection for their university in which they are first-year students, but, but hope for the future, uh, a belief the, the one is studying business, the other is biochemistry, another isn't sure what she wants to study, a, a third is uh, taking a chance in majoring in theater, fourth is taking a chance in majoring in theater. Um, they, uh, they believe in themselves, they're grateful to their parents, they believe in the future, they're happy to be getting a an outstanding education at Rutgers, and yeah, they complain that the, the meals on Saturdays aren't as good as they should be, and that you sometimes have to wait longer for the bus than you would like. But, but the 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 opportunity and the experience are are uh, a joy to them, and they and they they ooze that from every pore. Well, I know that my uh, uh, honors seminar last year was the best I've ever had. The students were the best I ever had, and now. I as the registration process goes on for next year, they look like they're even better in terms of the enthusiasm and the devotion and the understanding that you're talking about. I'm not talking about them, I'm talking about their parents. <laughs> uh, and I'm talking about those who are not making the investment. But let me ask what you think the impact will be of what President Obama has suggested thus far in terms of higher education? Well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased. The, uh, 
the uh, higher education uh, proposals that he made were enacted by the Congress and signed uh, by the President. It means that there will be significant um, improvements in the size uh, and availability of Pell Grants over the years, that they will rise not as much as I would like, but that they will be uh, uh, available to uh, more students. Pell, Pell Grants are the, uh, it, it's the, it's the federal need-based scholarship program uh, that uh, depends upon uh, uh, the family's income. Uh, about 30 percent of Rutgers students qualify for federal Pell Grants, so it's terribly important. Uh, unfortunately, the amount of the grants has stagnated for a while. Now it will, now it will rise. Uh, the federal government has also uh, it enacted and made universal the uh, federal direct lending program, which means that the federal government itself will lend money to uh, students who need it, uh, rather than through the middleman of a bank. This uh, this frees up uh, many millions of dollars, which can be further invested in in student aid. And I'm pleased that uh, that recommendation of President Obama's has also been has also been uh, it, it enacted. Do you think there was anything, when I began to teach at Rutgers, there was still the mass of GIs yes. who were there. When that was over, when they were no longer there, teaching wasn't all that much fun for some time. Do you think there was something about the crucible through which they had gone that was then reflected in the attitude of all of us. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting point. Yes, I do. I wasn't myself teaching at that time. I was far too young to do that. But, uh, but now, um, now uh, we're seeing a new generation of, uh, of veterans uh, return to our classrooms. They've been in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. They have, uh, in some cases, experienced very, very uh, challenging, life-changing trauma. Uh, but they are, they are entering our classrooms by the hundreds. Rutgers has some four to five hundred uh, uh, veterans uh, in, our, in our midst right now. And they are, uh, they are a very together, impressive group of men and women. They're making themselves heard and they're, they're letting us know what they need and how much uh, they value the education they're getting. God willing, they will do that and be the same influence that the returning veterans were back in the 40s. Dr. McCormick, thank you so much for visiting with me again today on The Open Mind. It's always a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thanks. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time. And meanwhile, as another old friend used to say, good night and good luck. And do visit The Open Mind website at www.theopenmind.tv. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Blue Stein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.